Hello, my Spilling Chai listeners. How are you? Welcome to episode seven of season two of the show. Is there a group of women more stereotyped or more misunderstood than Muslim women? From being collectively labeled as subjugated, oppressed, uneducated, helpless victims, despite the fact that Islam spreads from America to the Middle East, to South Asia, to Indonesia, when it comes to Muslim women, we are immediately reduced to a collective, offensive, and incorrect stereotype. Well, contrary to well-established misconceptions, Muslim women are not a monolith, and no one's life and career embodies that truth more than our guest today. I am talking about Saudi businesswoman and activist Muna Abu Suleiman. Abu Suleiman is the former founding secretary general of the Al Walid bin Talal Foundation, the philanthropic arm of Prince Al Walid bin Talal's kingdom, Kingdom Holding Company. And she is also the co host of Kalam Nawim television show, which is a very popular show in the Middle East. Abu Suleiman was named a young leader by the World Economic Forum and is often called upon to speak on issues related to challenges facing the youth and government around the world. She became the first woman from Saudi Arabia to be appointed by the United Nations Development Program as a goodwill ambassador. In 2009, Abu Suleiman was named one of the most influential Muslims in the world, and she is our guest today on Spilling Chai. Hello and welcome to the show, Muna. Any woman with a voice and an opinion knows how bad internet trolls can be online. You recently took a Saudi Twitter personality to court for what you called a smear campaign against you. Do you think that we have strong enough laws to protect women from this kind of online harassment? So I don't think there are laws to protect women. I think there are some laws to protect citizens. They differ in intensity and in prosecution, depending on the country that we speak of, as well as what are their usual media policies. So, for example, in England, where you have um, higher or more stringent laws regarding um, false information, it'll be much easier to prosecute somebody than, for example, in the U.S., where their laws have a little bit more leeway of interpreting, you know, whether something is um, a parody or um, an attempt at misinformation. And we're seeing this play out with the U.S. elections, um, how difficult it's been to actually get just wrong information off of the internet. Yes. Women are particularly vulnerable. And we know this because we've seen that the amount of harassment that happens is directed more towards women. A lot of people leave social media due to these things, or they go and have shadow accounts, which is without their real names, so that they can participate, but they would not be getting a lot of video. So my, my story was that the person that did this, it's a, there's a lot of trolling going on, but it was a verified account. And so we can know who the person is. It wasn't um, a complete troll. That's one. Second of all, um, the information that he had put is easily proven to be false. And so I was able to um, do it, but yet it took almost two years. Oh, wow. Yes, to get through until the verdict was, um, uh, was done or was given out. Do you think people were aware in Saudi Arabia that you can take people to court for this? Because a lot of times citizens don't even know that this is something you can prosecute. So people do know, but one of the issues is that a lot of these accounts that are trolling are shadow accounts. So you don't know who is behind it or from where. And to be able to get that information through the Ministry of Communication and Technology or through um, the Ministry of Interior is not easy. They do protect the privacy of citizens. So that's one. The second thing, it is quite expensive to hire a lawyer. And if it's one person that you know, you could actually do it. It takes a long time. But if you're being targeted and you have hundreds of people trolling you, who are you going to prosecute? You're going to have to go through all of that real negative stuff, uh, figure out who are the um, initiators or who are the worst case you know, instigators, and then do your homework and then go after five or 10. And that's going to be very expensive. So most people don't do it just because of the amount of work and expense that goes into this. So with the person that I had uh, taken to court, once the verdict was given, we 
realized that he was somebody who is very low income and you could not pay the fees of the lawyer at least or any kind of compensation for me. And so it was the reason that I forgave him was because he was going to be put in jail for like six months. And he was like a 27 year old. And I was like, I got the verdict. I can use it. It will serve as a lesson to others, but I can't put somebody six months in jail for it. So I forgave him. Wow. Wow. Good for you. So the U.S. is going into a historic election, obviously, in November. You know, America has never voted during a pandemic and there's so much on the ballot. What does seeing Kamala Harris being picked as Biden's vice president choice mean to you as a woman of color? So, of course, we had, you know, Hillary Clinton four years ago. And so this is not the first time that we've had a woman on the ballot as a president or vice president. And there's other, um, you know, Sarah Palin also was on the Republican um, ticket, as well as um, some others. Yeah, but a woman of color, you know, because, you know. So, yeah. so first, I, I'm, I'm tackling the issue with women. So we know that women actually are very capable yeah. to get there. Choosing a woman of color who has both Asian and African-American heritage or Jamaican heritage was extremely interesting and, you know, beautiful to see. It's sort of like the Obama moment again, when he was elected, you're thinking that this could be historical, but at the same time, there is this fear in the back of your mind that racism and polarization have worked to actually divide the country so much that Biden could lose because of this beautiful thing that we all admire, but there's, you know, a significant segment of population in the U.S. that this has become an issue for them. And we've been seeing this with the Black Lives Matter and the justifications of of racism that is just absolutely insane and unbelievable. The other thing I have to admit is she just has the most amazing skin. (laughs) (laughs) She really does, right? She's so telegenic. (laughs) But I'm so happy that nobody has asked her, what does she use? Because that's such a sexist, you know, no no man would get that. So I'm glad that nobody asked, but at the same time, I'm hoping that maybe after she gets elected that she would be, (laughs) you know, gracious enough to share. (laughs) She has great genes, I'm sure, you know, but still just amazing skin. I, and I love the story that she got married in her 50s. Oh, yes. Yes. A woman who worked very hard, who did everything on her own, who reached really high status in the career path that she has chosen, and then choosing to get married. It's, it's just a beautiful story. Beautiful example, role model. You were recently named a global trustee of the Commons Project, which was established with support from the Rockefeller Foundation to build digital platforms for the common good. Tell me more about your work with this group. So this is a very interesting position that I got, and I got it because I'm a young global leader, and Paul Mayer is one of the um, people uh, who uh, started this uh, project. And what got me involved was this idea that you can actually use international organizations, including the World Economic Forum and the Young Global uh, Leadership, to cut across a lot of bureaucracy over almost 120 countries to be able to solve the big issues. So the Commons Project is about how do we solve the big issues using the resources that we have and international entities that are neutral to figure things out. And our first uh, project is a common pass, which is about How can we create something in common that allows people that are dealing with COVID to overcome it for travel, logistics, uh, even um, types of tests and making sure that the world can move on? So it's a very interesting challenge to uh, solve it. And I'm just extremely flattered that they asked me to be part of it. Oh, wow. Fantastic. So my last question, which I'm sure you get a lot, but it's still so inspiring to me. You shatter so many stereotypes of Saudi women, Muslim women, women in the Middle East. What is your advice to young women who dream big? How do you thrive in the world as a brown girl, as a woman of color? I'm very proud to be a person of color. I'm very proud to be a brown girl. I'm very proud that as a Muslim, I'm actually the product of so many civilizations. As you know, I'm from Mecca. And Mecca is the first global village. There's been people going in and living there for thousands of years. It was always a mazar, a place where pilgrims will go before even Islam started. 
And so for me, being a global citizen is extremely important. But when you become a global citizen and you leave your little niche and where you're comfortable, where you are part of the majority and you become part of the minority, you start seeing all these obstacles, invisible obstacles. And I remember I used to tell people that I would work with that I'm being treated differently. I know that I'm being treated differently than, you know, people who are of other ethnicities that are more, you know, in in mainstream. And I don't want to say just white because there are other it depends on which part of the world you're operating in, right? And they would say, no, you're imagining this. And I would be mostly in male-dominated spheres. And they would actually also kind of think that you're making things up. And then suddenly, about five or six years ago, as more and more people of color started to join more organizations started to have a, a bigger voice, maybe even from the Obama administration's time, I would say. These kind of invisible, institutionalized, sometimes racist and misogynistic behaviors started to come out. And suddenly people were having these conversations and people would come to me and say, I remember 15 years ago when you came and you told us this happened and we didn't believe you. And so it's very draining. But my advice is if you have a mission, you try to go through every obstacle, get mentors who went through these obstacles or who are able to help you overcome them if they didn't go through it personally, but they kind of are supportive, are empathetic towards people like you, whether you're a woman or a person of color or, you know, LGBTQ or whatever situation that you're in that you feel marginalized in. So having a mentor and a sponsor and and two different things. So as you know, a sponsor is the person who's going to fight for you in the boardroom when you're not there. They're going to say, this person deserves that position and they will speak on your behalf, whereas a mentor just helps you out. You need both. You also need to have a purpose in life. And if you don't have a purpose in life, you just want to have ambition. You kind of start and stop and start and stop and you never get anywhere. So if you keep that purpose as your North Star, no matter what detours or where life takes you, for me, it was that I actually got pregnant and had a baby by the age of 19, which is something that I didn't expect or didn't plan for, never thought it would be my life path, you can still get to where you want to go because you use everything. The other thing that I really advise people to think about, especially women who are from the developing world or the global South, where there's a lot of tradition and there's a lot of expectations, a lot of issues, and it takes us longer to be able to shed these things, is to always think of life as an adventure. Whatever happens, whatever detour you get on. Enjoy it. Keep your purpose in front of you. Have that North Star, but also enjoy the journey. A lot of people are struggling against the journey. And the more obstacles you have, the more detours you're going to take, the longer it might take you to accomplish what you want. But if you enjoy the whole journey, it just makes life a lot easier, a lot better. And you won't have resentment later on of how much it took you to get somewhere where other colleagues might have gotten, you know, a lot faster. So these would, these would be my uh, pieces of advice for women. You know, they always tell women that it's about balancing work and family. And then some people say, (laughs) oh, there is no balance. And then other people say, you can't have it all. And then now people are saying, oh, you can have it all, just not at the same time. What do you say to that? Okay, so this is another difficult question, right? Because people want to hear that you can have it all. And yes, you might have it all at different times, or but nobody, not even the people that you think have it all, have it all, right? And the the one thing which is now as a much older, I'm you know, entering my fifth decade of life. I think my sixth decade, sorry, my sixth decade of life. <laughs> <laughs> just take a decade off. It's okay. It just shaved off 10 years <laughs> of mine. Yeah, I'm, I'm entering that. And there is really wisdom as you grow older that you are seeing things in different perspectives. So I tell women is that we deal with stress differently. Men, they get a heart attack, they get strokes, they get this kind of, or they get through their midlife crisis and they basically just upend their whole life and you know become a Buddhist monk somewhere. But with the women, whether you've had children or not, it doesn't matter. But if you've had children, it makes it more difficult. Is that we actually 
blow our thyroids out. We become extreme fatigue. There's a reason there's a lot of women who are so fatigued and so stressed out and you know, they, we start having hormonal issues. And so with my children, I've told them the same thing that I told your audience, enjoy the journey. And my eldest daughter had some issues with choices that she's made in education at work. And because I kept saying, enjoy it, don't stress out. Now, when she's almost 30, she's saying, now I get what you were saying. You'll have a better health. You'll have a better life. Now, Again, your audience is twofold. We have a more laid back type of life in the Middle East, even in Europe, but in the US, it really is a rat race where you're always on the go and you're always expected to perform. And it's great for the economy. It's great for the GDP, but it sucks. And I think COVID-19 with having people stuck at home actually made a lot of people realize how much it took from them to be always on the run. And that's something that we should really reconsider how we balance as a society, our lives so that we can actually slow down. One of the things I really love, obviously I follow you on social media and you talk so much about your father and your father's influence in your life. Talk to me about him. Tell us about your relationship with him and what kind of influence he's been in your life. So my father is suffering from dementia right now. And we actually realized this only three, four years ago, but we also realized that he had it 10 years prior, but he was able to hide it so well. He was able to perform while he was actually losing his memory and his sense of self. My relationship with him is both as a daughter who loves her father, who's an extremely empathetic, nice, kind person, just quite understanding, somebody who has given me a lot of leeway to grow up and make mistakes. And at the same time, be a support for me if I ever fall down. And given the type of choices that I made that were at the time revolutionary, very condemned by a lot of people, that meant a lot to me. At the same time, he is an exceptional scholar. He's a very well-known, world-renowned Islamic scholar who created a lot of the greatest entities for Islamic thought. And to see him lose that, to not even remember the work that he did was extremely painful. It's extremely painful right now as he is also starting to forget us. Um, Being a caregiver, I'm not the main caregiver, my mother is, but I am a primary caregiver for him. And it's a choice I made because I, I could have, you know, lived somewhere else, but I decided to live in the same area as my parents, the same city, so that I could actually be there for him. And it, it's, it's extremely painful to see, but I, you know, I feel that it is It is a way to show love, to be there for him as he's going through this, to hold his hand. Uh, It's the most difficult thing I've gone through, and I've gone through a lot, you know, not just divorces, not just uh, bankruptcies, not just, you know, misogynistic, Islamophobic um, attacks. It is the most difficult thing that I've ever gone through. You know, for him, for being such an Islamic scholar, and also to have been so supportive during your divorce, this is very revolutionary, but most people that know Islam and study Islam know that this is supported. What was it like to have your father support you when you decided to get a divorce? And you've also managed to have a pretty healthy co-parenting relationship. How did you pull this off? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's kind of amazing in any culture. (laughs) So all the decisions that I've ever made, reflected my beliefs, reflected the way that I work, the way that I think. the way. So having a very healthy, as you said, co-parenting relationship at a time, and I was divorced about 18, 19 years ago, when some people would say, if you're divorced, you can't even speak to the other, co- to the other parent. You have to have complete separation. Um, remember, this is 20 years ago. Saudi Arabia was quite different. Whereas we actually had meetings, we would have lunches together so that the children would see us together as a family. It was one part of my upbringing in the U.S. where I saw these things happen. And I always say that one of the people that affected my decision on how to co-parent was when Debbie Moore and Bruce Willis got divorced and they would go to screenings together with their kids. And I would see it in People's Magazine. There was no internet at the time. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a really, you know, healthy relationship to be in and not knowing that a few years later, 
I would actually use them as a role model. The other thing is my dad is a real Islamic scholar, right? So he knows if you decide to divorce, there's no shame. There's no problem. There's no issue in it. You just have to make the decision. And I also have a very decent ex-husband, I have to admit. Uh, He's somebody who is very well educated. He is progressive. He is somebody that, as I set out our, I would say, operational modus operandi, would go along believing that I know better or I understood more. And so he would just agree to whatever I said. I, I would say that we need, you know, every month to actually have a discussion on the kids on one, two, three. We need to do this. We need to do that. And he would just secede thinking that <laughs> I researched the matter, <laughs> which I did. I read a lot, uh, which he didn't. Uh, but so I, I have to admit that I also had somebody who was willing to also go against society, believing that I knew better, which I did. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, this is going to be my last, last question. You do so much work and you have done such, I mean, when you look at your career, it it has spanned decades, but also so many, so many, you've checked so many different boxes. What motivates you to do the work that you do? I see a problem and I want to solve it. And a lot of the times I start seeing trends just because I travel so much and I read so much that people that are bubbling under the surface and I start to tackle them, whether as in a philanthropic way, so you actually start looking at ways to support something to be solved or to bring media awareness. And that was, that's the easiest part of my job is to bring subjects up and then see who would be interested to solve it and help them solve it, whether, you know, through a supply chain of providing um, the ecosystem that they can plug into or just the thinking process for them. But this is how I operate. I see a challenge. I think, okay, it's very interesting. And then I get people to be with me. I don't go at it alone. I'm not somebody who wants to have the glory of saying, you know, I solved this. And actually, one of the most beautiful things is that now going back, as you said, when you've worked for 20, 30 years, you can go back and you see some patterns. And the pattern is that whenever I figure out that something that I cared about is being carried on by a new generation that is taking it on and they're doing, and they may not remember that I was part of the beginning of it. I move on to something else. And, you know, years later, you're seeing an institution come up that is an idea that you had and you had a discussion with it. And I remember, so I'll tell you an example. I remember sitting with somebody in a meeting and they're describing a center uh, for training and they're describing, describing, and then they just look at me and they're like, wait a minute, you're the one who did the study and came up with the solution. <laughs> and it was me who actually realized that we needed training for the NPO and geo sector in Saudi Arabia. And I spent like three years working on it. And then I gave it to somebody who went around shopping it to different foundations. And they did it. Uh, it, it came to them uh, ready. And so, but they had brought it in. And it was only after like almost 30, 35 minutes into the meeting when they're describing. And I didn't say anything. I was just so happy that it's being done, that they realized it was my idea. But you see these things come up and you see the things that you thought there are pillars that need to be placed in some places. There's awareness that needs to be made on some issues, different ways of thinking. And you see society move into that. And it's just extremely gratifying. Wow. Well, Mona, thank you so much. Please give my give my love and my salam to your father. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It, it was a pleasure being on on your uh, show. Sipping chai. <laughs> I'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much. From girls suck at math to real men don't cry to he is getting a bit senile with age. There's no shortage of common cultural stereotypes. In fact. Many psychologists compare stereotypes to air, invisible but always present. The important thing, I think, isn't being embarrassed that we may harbor stereotypes, but the willingness to be open to having them challenged and broken. One of the things that I love about being a Muslim woman is getting the opportunity to do just that on a regular basis. If you enjoyed this episode of Spilling Chai, please make sure to subscribe and review the show. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Spilling Chai Podcast. And until next time, let's keep brewing the chai. Chai.